My name is Judy and I'm 33 years old. I don't really have a big family, so witnessing such a large event was definitely one of the perks of marrying my husband, Kyle. The music was blasting and the air was filled with the laughter and chatter of my husband's family. This was the first time that I had ever been at a function like this. Kyle, unlike me, came from a very big family. They were celebrating a family reunion in a big way with at least a hundred people in attendance. It was an opportunity for us to meet distant relatives and enjoy good food. But as fate would have it, the day turned out to be a nightmare for me. Although this outing was meant to be one filled with joy and celebration, it turned sour when I came in contact with my evil and rude mother-in-law. You see, she made it her life mission to disrespect and belittle me, especially because she was under the impression that I was unable to conceive. But she couldn't be more wrong. I just couldn't tell her the truth, at least not yet. You see, my journey to motherhood has been far from easy. It's a road riddled with medical appointments, emotional roller coasters, and dashed hopes. But what made it even more excruciating was having Hannah, a woman who should be a pillar of support constantly prodding and mocking my inability to conceive. She approached me at the function and said this, Judy, my dear, you're still not pregnant. You should really get a move on, you know. You're not getting any younger. Oh, wait, you're infertile. What a shame. I really wish that my son married someone who could at the very least conceive a baby. I was taken aback by her words. How could someone be so blatantly rude and malicious? I could feel the blood rushing to my face. Not believing that I heard her correctly, I simply had to ask her to repeat herself. What did you say? You didn't hear me? Must be all this loud music. Hold on for one second. As if I wasn't already sufficiently embarrassed by my situation, this woman did the unthinkable. Because this was such a large event, Hannah walked over to the DJ and requested to use his mic. Attention! Attention, everyone! Everyone started to pay attention to what she was saying, and I had a deep, dreading feeling of what was coming next. Some of you might know Judy, Kyle's wife. I wasn't going to do this, but I thought that this would be a great teachable moment for not only her, but for everyone who is here at this event. We're all family, right? Noticing that this had bad news written all over it, my husband Kyle, who was somewhere off in the distance, started making his way to the DJ booth. He knew his mother all too well and knew that she wasn't going to say anything positive about me. Unluckily though, he was way too far to reach her on time. If you turn your attention towards Judy, you see that she's not pregnant or carrying an infant. This is honestly shocking considering she's been married to Kyle for five years now. Anyhow, it's not her fault, I guess. She is infertile after all. Mom, that's enough. Although Kyle screamed this out, his unamplified voice was no match for the big and booming microphone his mother was using, so she continued. Don't worry, Kyle. This is a teachable moment. Judy, I know the truth is hard to hear, but you have to hear it anyways. You are infertile, and as a result of that, you're wasting everyone's time here. We're all not getting any younger, and I want to see my grandchildren. I think it would be best if you two did something like get a surrogate or a divorce. There I was, my face redder than any of the tomato dishes that were there and with myriads of eyes looking my way. I'm serious, Judy. You should honestly consider doing something about that infertility. It's quite selfish and embarrassing. I said I want to see my grandchild. Thankfully, she was cut off by Kyle, who finally got to her. I, for one, couldn't move at all. It was like I was frozen. It seemed like a hundred pairs of eyes were looking at me all at once and I just wanted the earth to open up and swallow me whole. I felt humiliated as everyone was looking at me. Although Kyle stopped her, the damage was already done. 
Some people looked at me with a disgusted face. Others shared a look of sympathy. But honestly, a lot of people just seemed to share my embarrassment. They were embarrassed for me. And as someone who doesn't like being pitied, this was the worst feeling to encounter. I felt helpless. I'm normally the type of girl who speaks her mind, but how could I with all these people looking at me? The DJ tried to resume the festivities and wash over the embarrassing moment, but as I mentioned, the damage had already been done. Some people began to resume what they were doing before, but I just knew that people were gossiping about the situation and that this would be a hot topic in the family group chat for weeks to come. I did what many other people would have done in this situation. I fled. I felt so unwelcome and so unloved. As I saw Kyle and Hannah talking, more so arguing, off to the side, I made my escape. I ran inside the house to find the nearest bathroom to lock myself in. I cried and cried for what felt like hours and then I got a knock on the door. It was none other than my loving husband, Kyle. What he said when he saw my red eyes and puffy cheeks shocked me. I swear to God, after today, I'm never speaking to that woman again. Kyle, you can't say that. She's your mother. Yeah, and she's also a bully. I, I can't ever show my face here ever again. We can go home right now if you want to. Say the word and we're out of here. No, that will mean I've admitted defeat. What did you say to her? Kyle went on to tell me how he berated her for her insolence and her rudeness. Why would she say something like that? We don't even know half of the people who are here. I still can't believe she said that. I know, love. I've let her walk over you for too long. I'm sorry I let it get to this point. We hugged and I continued crying in his arms. This is why I love this man so much. After being conditioned in my childhood for so long that I needed to be strong and wipe away those tears, Kyle was always here to catch them and console me. I pulled away from him slightly, looking up at the love of my life. His warm brown eyes met mine and I was struck once again by how much I loved this man. I smiled weakly despite my tears. Hoping to distract myself from the humiliation, I asked, Do you remember how we met? Kyle chuckled. Of course I do. How could I forget such a beautiful day? I laughed too, remembering that fateful day we were both studying at the library of our university and ended up fighting over the last available power outlet. We struck up a deep and meaningful conversation and before we knew it, hours had passed. We exchanged numbers and the rest, as they say, is history. I love you so much, Kyle. I love you too, Judy, more than anything in this world. And if you need us to go home, then please let me know. This party's dead anyways, after that stupid stunt my mother pulled. Kyle, do you remember when we found out? He nodded, a pained expression crossing his face. We were trying so hard, and I thought that maybe I was the infertile one, but finding out that it was you who was infertile was somehow even worse for me. I was ready to handle it if it was me, but you're just so perfect. I never expected it to be you. I never wanted that for you. I'm so sorry. I know, babe. It was a tough time for both of us. But we got through it together, and we'll get through this too. Kyle smiled at me, his love for me shining in his eyes. I knew then that we were in this together, no matter what life threw at us. You should tell her the truth. What? I, I couldn't possibly do that. I should have just been honest with the family about everything. I didn't know she harbored this much resentment for us not having kids yet. And what's worse, she automatically assumes it's your fault. If I was just honest from the beginning, then none of this would have happened. Kyle, don't beat yourself up. Even you know your mother is crazy. She probably would have found another way to humiliate me even if you did do that. It's fine, babe. I don't mind her hating me, but I can't stand the idea of her not liking you because of your infertility. You know her obsession with continuing this bloodline. 
That's true. I mean, she did invite a hundred people to this thing, which is ridiculous now that I think about it. So, no, I'm not going to do that. Wait here. Before I could even question where he was going, he let go of me and left the bathroom. I was still reeling from the embarrassment I was feeling, so I opted to heed his words and stay in the bathroom. Five minutes had gone by, and just when I thought that Kyle had done something stupid like renounce the family name or expose himself to the family, he came back in. Thank goodness I thought you went to do something stupid. I was about to burst out of here and stop you. You still might try and stop me, but I won't let you. What do you mean? What did you do? I couldn't believe my eyes when Kyle handed me the stack of papers. What are these? My infertility results, as well as your high fertility results. I printed them out in the library. I felt my stomach drop. How could he have done this without even telling me? And now he wanted me to show them to Hannah? I couldn't do that. I couldn't just humiliate him like that in front of everyone. I can't do that, Kyle. I told you I wouldn't do it. I can't just show these to her. But Judy, she humiliated you in front of everyone. She deserves to be put in her place. She'll be embarrassed because of how wrong she was. I know, but I just can't do it. It's not fair to you. I don't care about that. She's the one who's going to be embarrassed. Being infertile is nothing to be embarrassed about, even though it's so heavily frowned upon. There are ways to fix it, babe, and I think I'm ready to face these skeletons head on. I think we should look at alternative methods of conceiving. I looked up at him, feeling overwhelmed by his love and selflessness. How could he be so willing to sacrifice himself like this? And what's more, it seemed like he was ready to properly face this ailment and take the necessary steps in fixing his situation. For such a long time, it was a sore subject, but now, as I looked into his loving eyes, I could see the amount of healing and growth that he's been through to be at this exact moment of clarity and compassion. But Kyle, it's not just about that. It's also about the fact that she's never respected me. She's never even tried to get to know me, and now she's just making fun of my infertility like it's some kind of joke. Kyle put his arm around me, pulling me closer. I know, Judy, and that's why we have to do this. We have to stand up to her and show her that we won't be pushed around anymore. I looked up at him, feeling grateful for his strength and support. Okay, let's do it. We went outside to greet the crowd. The good thing is, it seemed like everyone resumed the festivities, but little did they know that more chaos was about to ensue. I gave Kyle the, are you sure, look one last time, and he confirmed his answer by leading me to the very same DJ booth that I was embarrassed at not so long ago. Kyle grabbed the mic and got everyone's attention. Attention everyone, we have something important to say. People, for the second time during this event, with their heads in the direction of the booming voice coming through the microphone. Earlier today, my wife was attacked unfairly and quite rudely for no good reason. And now, she wants to give her side of the argument. Kyle handed the mic to me. I gulped as I recognized that everyone had their attention on me now. I scanned the crowd and I was met by one pair of glaring eyes. It was none other than Hannah, looking at me with absolute disgust and disdain. As I was speaking, she was making her way to the booth. Hello everyone, as you may or may not know, I'm Kyle's wife and Hannah is my mother-in-law. I need to repeat the harmful words that were, That's enough! I didn't realize that Hannah was already nearing the booth. Instead of my fear increasing, however, ironically enough, it was my confidence and my anger that was being amplified and I proceeded. I was sick of her incessant rudeness stagnating my growth and self-worth. Kyle was right. I needed to put her in her place. You will not interrupt me while I speak. I gave you your chance to speak and now it's my turn. Shocked and taken off guard by my feistiness, she shut up. Thank you. As I was saying, I need not repeat what was said about me, but I am a lover of truth 
And I thought that if someone is spreading misinformation about me and my family, even if it's a very personal and private matter, I need to rectify the information that is being presented. Turning to face Hannah squarely, I now said, You think that I'm infertile and that I'm unable to conceive a baby? Well, I'll tell you what the real truth is. It's your son. Kyle is the infertile one. These are the documents that prove that. Kyle handed over the documents to Hannah, who was very shocked. The crowd was also murmuring and gasping all around. I looked at Kyle to make sure he was okay, and he was even smiling and chuckling at everyone's surprised expressions. But the expression that was the funniest was my mother-in-law's. Silence filled the area, and everyone's attention was drawn to us. Hannah's face turned pale, as if I had just slapped her. What are you talking about? That this can't be true. Oh, but it is true. And what's more, I am the one who has a high fertility rate. More gasps and murmurs were reverberating through the crowd. This scene looked like it was pulled straight out of a movie. I, I, I don't even know what to say. Kyle, why didn't you tell me about this? Maybe because I wasn't ready. The topic of infertility can be a sensitive one, and I know that you wouldn't have done that to me if I was in that position. But the fact that you blatantly try to embarrass my wife in front of everyone doesn't sit right with me. I had to set things straight. K Kyle, I'm so sorry. Don't say sorry to me. Apologize to Judy. It was as if Kyle had asked her to recite the King James Version of the Bible in Latin. She was so hesitant. But Kyle persisted. He even grabbed the mic from me and began to chant, Apologize! He kept chanting it over and over, and slowly but surely the crowd followed suit, all demanding for Hannah to apologize to me for her evil words. Because she was too proud, even the pressure from a whole mob of family members couldn't sway her from her disdain for me. I'll do no such thing. She doesn't deserve it. Even if I was incorrect about the fertility thing, she, she, why didn't she just say it? It's her fault for not clearing up the air earlier. And now she wants to embarrass me. People began to boo at her like she was a terrible music artist performing a terrible set. Feeling embarrassed on her property, she ran inside the house attempting to escape the judgment that was being passed. The story doesn't end there, folks. We resumed the festivities while Hannah spent the rest of the event held up in her room. Several aunts and uncles made attempts at luring her out of her room, but to no avail. She was stuck in her pride and it was leaving a sour taste in people's mouths. Nonetheless, we enjoyed the rest of the reunion with various family members, both known and extended, approaching Kyle and me and commending us on our bravery. Some people were glad we finally put that woman in her place and others didn't know the extent of her maliciousness reached this far. We ended the evening being closer. It truly felt like a big old happy family reunion by the end, which I was so grateful for. After the family reunion fiasco, I was exhausted and drained. But the next day, we received a call from one of Kyle's aunts. She said, that the family had a meeting and agreed that they wouldn't include Hannah in any future family events until she apologizes. They also recommended that we remain distant from her until she can grow up and take accountability. I agreed with the decision wholeheartedly. After all, I didn't want to be subjected to her cruel remarks again. I wasn't surprised by the decision, as I knew how stubborn and unapologetic Hannah could be but it still stung to hear that our family was now officially divided due to Hannah's incessant hatred towards me. Kyle and I discussed the situation, and we both agreed that it was time to move on. We couldn't keep enabling Hannah's toxic behavior by being bystanders in her abuse, and we needed to protect our mental health. We were already going through so much, and especially since we wanted to start a new chapter in our lives, and build a family of our own. It was time to say goodbye to the drama and focus on building a happy, healthy life together. So we said our goodbyes to Hannah without any regrets or second thoughts. 
we sent her an email detailing our feelings and Kyle left her a long voice note telling her that he would love for her to be part of the new life that we're trying to build, but there was no way he was going to allow toxicity and negative energy to be part of it. Unsurprisingly, she never responded and to this day we haven't gotten a response from her. Turns out she prioritizes her pride so much that she's willing to give up her relationship with her potential grandchildren. Good riddance to bad rubbish, as they say. We didn't need that kind of negativity in our lives anyways, and we were better off without her. But deep down, I couldn't help but feel a twinge of sadness, at least for Kyle. Hannah was still Kyle's mother, after all. I had hoped that we could be close one day, but it seemed like that would never happen. I don't know how Hannah is doing now, and I honestly don't care, but what I do know is that I'll never forget that day, and I'll never let anyone make me feel inferior again. I don't want to see your face any longer. I don't want any trash in my new dream house, so just get out. Huh? What? Yes. I don't want to live with such a trashy woman. My name is Laura and I'm 34 years old. I was married to Paul who was four years younger than me, but it was never a matter of concern until lately. I met Paul at my friend's party. My friend Lucy and Paul were gym friends. Paul was a handsome young man with a chiseled jawline and strong physique. He was charming and a jovial man. I was single at that time and Lucy wanted to desperately set me up with someone. She introduced me to every single man at the party. That's how I was introduced to Paul. Hey Paul, meet my nerdy millionaire friend Laura. Lucy, stop embarrassing me. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed, it was a compliment. I blushed and said, thank you. Lucy, you could have included beauty with brains in Laura's introduction. Well, you're right. She is indeed a beauty with brains. Now, you both have a good time and I'll attend to the other guests. After Lucy went, Paul asked, Hey, why did Lucy call you a nerd? I smiled and said, Well, I am an engineer and I work for a software company which keeps me busy most of the time, so I don't get enough time to socialize and hang out with my friends, so they call me a nerd. Wow, that's awesome. So you must be having a handsome salary, hence they call you a millionaire nerd. I burst out in laughter. Yeah, you could say that. We spent the evening chatting and getting to know each other. I found Paul to be extremely sweet and irresistible. Soon after that, we started meeting outside for coffee and dinner. Paul used to pick me up from work so that we could spend more time together. He worked as an assistant in a small company. After dating for a few months, Paul proposed to me. I loved Paul, but I felt it was too early to decide. Besides, Paul was four years younger than me, so I was concerned if he was serious about it. Paul, are you serious about this? Of course. We've been going out for a while now. It is only a couple of months since we met. Besides, you're four years younger than me. Paul chuckled. Oh, come on, Laura. Are you still stuck with all these age-old beliefs that the husband should be older than the wife? No, it doesn't matter to me, but I was wondering if you had a problem with this. Chill, Laura. You're a modern woman who shouldn't be thinking about these ridiculous things. Paul convinced me that we would live happily as a married couple. I finally agreed. We met each other's parents and informed them about our decisions. Although my father, Glenn, didn't say anything and was happy about my wedding, my mother asked me privately, Laura, honey, I hope you've discussed your finances with Paul. Yes, mom, don't worry. I'm just concerned with the fact that you are doing way better than Paul in your career, so that should not come as a problem between you both. Men are egotistic about these things. No, Mom, Paul is a sweet man. He does not have any such ego. In fact, he agreed to do the household chores as I have a busy working schedule. I'm glad to know this. Take care, honey. This conversation made me think that I have never discussed my finance with Paul. Neither did I ask him about his salary. 
I was never interested in his money as I earn well enough, but Paul had inquired about my salary. In fact, he asked me about my salary even before he proposed to me. I was worried about this for a while, but then I decided to ignore this. I was super excited to start my married life with Paul. After the wedding, we went on our honeymoon trip to Florida. The trip was sponsored by my company as a wedding gift. We lived our life to the fullest during this time. After a month, Paul sat me down after dinner and asked me for a favor. Honey, I'm so sorry to ask you this, but I need your help. What's up, Paul? Is everything all right? Well, no. My parents are in trouble. The apartment in which they are living is on the second floor without any elevator. As they are aging, it's becoming difficult for them to climb the stairs. Yeah, I understand. Why don't you shift them to another house on the ground floor or to an apartment with an elevator? He ignored my suggestion and said, Actually, Laura, I wanted to build a house for them. I was surprised to hear this. Okay, I hope you know how expensive it is to build a house, right? Mm, yeah, I know that. Do you have enough savings or are you planning to take a loan? Paul looked down for a few moments and then said, Laura, I was wondering if you could lend me the money to build the house. I was shocked. This was unexpected. I didn't know what to say. Huh? What? Since you earn so well, it should not be a problem for you. But Paul, I'm not sure if I can lend that huge amount of money. Why not? Paul became aggressive with his ask. I honestly didn't know how to deny his request, so I just said, Okay, let me think about it. Sure, I'll wait for your help. I spent the night wondering if I would be wise to lend all my savings to Paul, and that too to construct a house for his parents. I've been working so hard to earn this money and have saved it to buy my own house and retire peacefully. The next morning while I was leaving for the office, Paul hugged me and said, Laura, I'll be waiting for your decision. Let's discuss this on the weekend. I'm running late. I wasn't feeling too good about this. I didn't know what to do. So I spoke to my colleague regarding this. She suggested that I should make an official contract and get it signed by Paul so that he returns the money. That seemed to be a good idea to have everything official so that Paul does not back out later. I returned home and informed Paul that I can lend him the money but he would need to repay me in three years. To my surprise, Paul agreed to this. I made it clear to him that he would have to sign the official papers and if he defaulted, I could take action against him. Hearing this, Paul burst out in laughter. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Well, no, I'm serious. I have the papers too. What? I gave him a serious look, to which he said, Fine, I'll sign. He smirked at me and signed the papers. I transferred the money to him, although I still did not feel good about lending the money because Paul's salary was not sufficient to pay me back. Paul started behaving weirdly after this. He came home late and did not help with the household chores. Whenever I complained about this, he dismissed me, saying that he is busy at work. I gradually lost my affection for Paul. During the weekend, he was mostly away overseeing the construction of his new house. At times, he didn't come home, saying that he would stay at his parents' place to care for them. I was getting suspicious of his activity. I could no longer take this frustration and decided to confront Paul. Paul, do you realize that you have been acting weird all this while and living like a parasite in this house? What do you mean? How dare you use such words against me? First of all, you have been living on my expenses since we married. You have not contributed anything financially to this house. On top of that, now you don't even help me with the household chores. He looked into my eyes and responded casually. You knew that I was earning low. Then why did you marry me? I was shocked at his response. What? Excuse me? I'm not in the mood to fight with you now. I'm excited about the housewarming party that mom's organizing at our new dream house tomorrow. He said this as if he tried to mock me. 
I couldn't believe my ears. Paul did not even inform me that the house is already complete and they are throwing a housewarming party. I yelled at him. You built the house with my money and you didn't even inform me that the house is complete and your mother is organizing a housewarming party without even inviting me? What the hell? He casually responded. Oh, my bad. I must have forgotten. Please be our guest. He went out of the house, humming at the top of his voice as if nothing happened. I was so angry at him that I wanted to break everything which was there in front of me, but I somehow calmed myself. After an hour or so, I got a call from my mother-in-law. Hello? Hi, I called you to inform you that we are organizing a housewarming party at our new house tomorrow. Okay. I didn't say anything else and I hung up the phone. I was pretty sure that Paul would have asked her to call and invite me. If she genuinely wanted to invite me, she would have done so earlier. Besides, she does not like me. She never talked to me properly, even when she met me for the first time or even after the wedding. Initially, I didn't want to go to that party because of what has happened, but later I thought that if I don't go, Paul and his mother would badmouth me, saying that I'm jealous of their new house. So I decided to put up a fake smile and show up for a while. I reached the location to see that the entrance of the house was decorated with flowers and Paul was standing at the entrance with his mom greeting the guests. As I entered the house, my mother-in-law said, Oh, you came. I thought you wouldn't come. What made you think that? Paul intervened. Now that you have come, get inside. I went inside the house and met my father-in-law who was sitting alone on the chair. He greeted me with a genuine smile. He held my hand and thanked me for the money. That was the only time I felt happy about lending the money because neither Paul nor his mother has ever shown any gratitude for my help. Paul and his mother gave a cold shoulder to me throughout the event. I was just killing time, talking half-heartedly to Paul's relatives. I was eagerly waiting for the event to be over so that I could leave that toxic place. As soon as all the guests left, I went to my father-in-law to say goodbye before leaving. Goodbye, you take care of your health. Just then, my mother-in-law intervened. You don't need to be bothered about my husband when you can't take care of yours. Huh? What are you saying? You have been a lousy wife who doesn't do any household chores and gets them done by my son. What kind of wife are you? I didn't force your son to do the household chores. He volunteered to do so. Besides, I work too, so I need his help with the household chores. You should be grateful to him for tolerating a woman like you, but instead you abuse and torture my son. What are you talking about? I have never tortured or abused Paul. Don't pretend to be innocent. Paul has told me how you have mentally tortured him for the money and got an agreement signed as well. What kind of wife would do such mean things? My father-in-law tried to intervene. Megan, stop. Why are you unnecessarily torturing the girl instead of being grateful for what she has done for us? You sit there quietly or else get inside your room. I could not believe that Megan would misbehave with Thomas in this way. She then turned to me and said, You should be grateful to my son for marrying you. Else, who marries an old and ugly woman like you? I was so frustrated with her words, I lost my cool and I shouted back at her. How can you talk to me like this? Paul intervened. Laura, mind your language. How dare you raise your voice in front of my mother? Didn't you hear when she abused me? Paul rolled his eyes and said, I can't take your tantrums anymore. Huh? My tantrums? Do you realize how badly you and your mother are behaving with me? I don't want to see your face any longer. I don't want any trash in my new dream house, so just get out. Huh? What? Yes, I don't want to live with such a trashy woman. You've been living on my income all this time and now you're calling me trash? You're pathetic. Laura, let us get this straight. You knew you could have never found a handsome man like me, seeing your age and below average looks. Hence, 
you married me, although I didn't earn well, so now you should not be complaining about the money. My face turned red in anger. I felt tricked into this marriage. I yelled at him. I can't stay with such a shallow person. I want a divorce and my money back. Paul started laughing in an evil tone. Sure, you want a divorce? Go ahead. You have to pay me the money if you want a divorce. What the hell? Since you want the divorce, you have to bear it. Paul revealed the evil side of himself, which he was masking all this while. I was furious to see his evil smile. You have to pay my money back, which I lent you, else I'll sue you. <laughs> Go and find your stupid papers first. I felt numb. I left the place as I could not take any longer. They insulted and despised me. I went straight to my bank where I had kept the papers in the bank locker. I was shocked to see that the paper was missing from the locker. When I checked the bank log, I found that Paul has accessed the locker a month ago. It was a joint account, hence Paul too had the access to the locker. We opened this joint account after the wedding to save money from our earnings, but sadly, it was just me who was depositing the money. I kept a copy of the document in my wardrobe as well, which was missing too. After all this, I realized how badly Paul has tricked me into this marriage. He showed interest in me at Lucy's party only because of my high salary. He was living comfortably with my earnings in my house. Then he emotionally blackmailed me to lend the money for his house and later threw me out of that house. If this was not all, he stole the agreement paper so that I could not do anything to get the money back. I was tricked into all of these things, but not with the papers. I still managed to keep the original papers with me. I gradually sensed that Paul would betray me, hence I kept the original documents safe at my parents' house and kept a copy in the bank in the wardrobe. Despite all the pain and insults which I went through, I was glad that I followed my instinct and got the paper signed by Paul and kept it safe, away from his reach. I called up my mom and narrated the entire incident. My mom was so angry to know this that she wanted to sue Paul and his mother for torturing me. My mother also told me that she was not shocked to know this. I questioned her. Did you know about Paul's intention? No, I didn't know exactly, but I somehow sensed that he was just acting like he was in love with you. How did you sense that? He was in so in a hurry for the wedding. You barely knew each other when he proposed and insisted to marry. Well, yeah, you're right. I should have been careful. When you came home, I asked you if you've discussed the finances with him, to which you said yes. Actually, Mom, I lied to you. I'd never discussed my finances with him. Neither did I ask about his salary ever, because I was never bothered about his money. Well, take this as a lesson and don't trust anyone so soon. I hired a lawyer and sent the divorce papers along with the official notice, asking him to repay the amount in three years, or else the court would sell off his property to give me back the money. Paul and his mother had no idea what was coming to them. When the divorce papers and the notice for money reached them, they desperately tried to call me. I ignored all their calls and blocked their numbers. Paul tried to call my parents as well, but they ignored him too. Paul sent a voicemail to my office number saying, I'm sorry for all I did. Please forgive me. You know I love you so passionately. I got carried away by my mom. I'm hopeful that you would take me back. Paul has always used my emotions to trick me into his evil plan, but not this time. I deleted and blocked his contact. He also sent a message through his lawyer requesting me to waive the money at least by 50% as his salary was not enough to pay the hefty amount in three years. I ignored the request. I wonder how did he even think that I would wave off my money after all the insults and personal attacks. I can never forgive them. I patiently waited for three years to pass. Paul was barely able to manage 50% of the amount and that too through loans. The bank offers a loan based on the salary. 
As his salary was low, he could not get enough money from the bank. Hence, he had to sell the house. He insulted and threw me out of the dream house and now three years later, he has to sell his house to pay my money back. Lucy told me that Paul had moved back in with his parents into their old apartment. Everyone in the neighborhood gave them the cold shoulder after the truth came out. Megan constantly tortured Paul and Thomas for their poverty and insulted them for their low income. Paul was even criticized at his workplace after they got to know about the incident. He left his job and moved to a different city, and Thomas, too, abandoned Megan and went to live with his brother in the countryside. Megan has been working as a nanny for a living. I don't feel sorry for Paul or Megan because they both deserve that. I'm glad to know that Thomas would be living peacefully during his last retirement years. I, on the other hand, have been dating Charles for a year now. He is my colleague and 35 years old. I've known him for many years, but we had no romantic feelings earlier. He was from a different team at the office. A year after my divorce, Charles and I interacted at the office party and we started liking each other's company. I'm cautious this time and taking my own sweet time to analyze things before making any decision. Hi, I'm Anna, 27, female. Very recently, I became a mother for the first time to a beautiful, bouncing baby boy. He is my absolute pride and joy and I would do anything for him. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for his father, who is my husband. This is the story of how one of the most stressful days of my life became even more stressful because of my husband. My husband, Greg, is what some people call hard-headed. He's constantly shouting about something due to his serious nature. He doesn't really know how to let loose and have fun. Hey babe, I know you're seven months pregnant and all, but could you please pick up after yourself? You know how I feel about dirty dishes. Yes, Greg. We know about your undiagnosed OCD. What did you just say to me? Relax, relax, it was a joke. Calm down. Look, I'll do the dishes, but not now. My back is killing me. Ever since you got pregnant, you've been getting lazier and lazier. Maybe that's because making organs and carrying your child is a very taxing job. I loved it when my beautiful mother-in-law, Florence, Help me out when Greg was being particularly antsy. I know it is somewhat unconventional to get along with your mother-in-law. The general ideology is that in-laws are supposed to be your greatest enemies. But for me, that couldn't be further from the truth. Florence has helped me a lot. She knows her son can be a bit much at times and perhaps her helping me whenever she thinks it's necessary is her way of secondhand apologizing since Greg would never do it. Ugh, whatever. Just hurry up and give birth already so that I can have my wife back. This man was insufferable at times, I swear. You might be wondering why I don't just leave, which is a very good question that I, at the time that all of this went down, didn't know how to answer. Why don't you do the dishes, Greg? Greg looked at his mother as if she grew a second head at that moment. Because I'm busy. I have so much work to do and ever since Anna had to take maternity leave, I've had to work twice as hard to make up for where she's lacking. Well, I'm sorry that your bundle of joy is taking up all my time. Yeah, well, it's not like I didn't want this. Except, apparently, he did indeed not want this. This man, Greg, who I've been married to for the past three years, decided to come to me on my hospital bed and break things off. Can you imagine? Let me explain what happened. I was approaching nine months into my pregnancy. My due date had been scheduled and we were just waiting for the baby to make its arrival. When suddenly at 2 a.m. Babe! Hmm? Babe, wake up! Oh my God, what? I think my water just broke. Seriously? Uh, Yes, seriously. So, you want me to take myself to the hospital and give birth to your baby without you? You know that I have a big presentation coming up in the morning. You know how important it is to me. And yet you still somehow found a way to sabotage that and make everything all about you. Can't you just hold it? 
for like an extra day longer? By that point, I knew that this person had to be mentally ill or just pure evil because there was no way that he just said all of those things to me. He must have seen my surprised expression even though it was dark because he went on to say, Don't look like that. Women give birth all the time. It's just like sneezing for you all, right? You'll be fine. If you want to go, you can go. But you could have at least waited for us to deal with this in the morning. At that moment, I knew that this man was toxic and I could no longer be with him. I did my best, already feeling cramps and contractions, to hop out of bed into some comfy clothes and drive to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I was already in tears. People assumed that it was because of the pain I was in, which is true, I was in a lot of pain. But I was also experiencing a lot of emotional turmoil as well. All while I made my way to the hospital, I was replaying that awful conversation in my head. My husband was snoring peacefully in our bed while I was subject to the uncomfortable state that is childbirth. I was horrified, not only at Greg, but at myself for putting up with his nonsense for so long. How I didn't see it before, I would never know. But thankfully, perhaps due to all of the bright lights in the hospital, I could see clearly that this man was not right for me. Even though I fought those things, it was hard to actually verbalize it to him and say that I'm done with him, despite his acting this way. I loved him dearly, and he wasn't always like this. Despite the history of our relationship, I could see now that the Greg I fell in love with no longer existed. And now that I was bringing new life into this world, I had to make the right decision for me and my baby. All of these epiphanies came rushing in when I was having my contractions and when the nurses would come in and ask if any friends or family members would be with me to soothe me, I would just cry even more, knowing that I had no one to rely on. At that moment, I saw Florence burst into the room. Move out of my way. I'm her mother-in-law. I have every right to be here. I don't care if we're not biologically related. She's my family. Florence, ever being the stern individual, always knew how to get exactly what she wanted, including breaking hospital protocol, just so she could witness this moment. Normally, they only allow the direct family and partner to be in the delivery room, but she managed to break her way through. She looked angry as she approached me. Now, I should knock some sense into you for not calling me, but I can see that you're very preoccupied, so I'll let it slide this time. But don't you ever do that again. You scared me. Why didn't you call me? Florence, it's 3 a.m. I didn't want to disturb you. Disturb me? Disturb me? Have you lost your mind? There is no way that you could ever disturb me, especially during such a grand moment like this. This is my job. I'm here to protect and help you. God, I love this woman. How did you even get here? How did you know? Call it motherly intuition, but don't worry about how I found out. Just worry about pushing that baby out and being healthy and safe, okay? I'll be here to help you in all the ways that I can. And with that, all of my nerves and stresses began to melt away. No longer was I thinking about stupid Greg and his selfishness. I was just focused on delivering this baby and ensuring that they'd be happy. Two hours later, at 5.30 a.m. on March 14th, my beautiful baby boy was born. I named him Sam, and he was gorgeous. By my side the entire time was Florence, who was cheering me on, and once Sam was born, she couldn't put him down. She instantly fell in love. Due to the pain and the turmoil, I was constantly in and out of consciousness. But once I started to feel better, Florence and I began talking properly. Okay, seriously, how did you find out that I went into labor? Did Greg tell you? Yes, dear. He told me everything, including how he was unable to come to the hospital with you. He sent me here to be with you instead, and I swear I was going to stop by on the way to the hospital to knock some sense into him, but that would have taken too much time. I started to sob as the events of a couple of hours earlier washed over me, reminding me just how much of a low life my husband was. 
Oh no, please don't cry, sweetie. It's okay, I'm here. Please don't let little Samuel see you upset like this. Today is a beautiful day full of miracles. You just gave birth, my love. That is such a wonderful thing. I suppose she was right. Looking at Sam, I radiated nothing but joy, and I swear to God, whenever I'd look at him, he just took all of my pain away, both physical and mental. At that moment, I let Florence roam around a bit. She was with me for the past three hours, and she might have needed a bathroom or snack break, so after much convincing, I assured her that I had everything handled and that she could also go and take care of herself. Not five minutes after she left, I was visited by the devil himself. Standing at the doorway to my hospital room was none other than Greg. I was upset, but he too shared a look of anger and frustration as he was forced to be here. Hello? Can I see him? I gestured for him to come over and see his son, and for a moment it appeared as though my husband's icy heart had melted at least ever so slightly, because a flash of several emotions was splayed on his face. I could tell that he was joyous because of this event, but part of him looked sad as if saying that he regretted not being here. Just as quickly as these emotions came, however, they also left, and he was back to being his cold and strict self. Little Greg Jr. looks very happy and healthy. Good job, champ. Sam. What? His name is Sam. No, Greg Jr. What are you talking about? We discussed this already. If the baby was going to be a girl, we would have named her Delilah. And if it was going to be a boy, then Greg Jr. Well, considering that I did most of this myself, I decided to change that decision. It made the most sense to me anyway, since I came here and gave birth alone. Come on, Anna. Are you going to act like this? Do you know how many men would come to the hospital at five in the morning just to check up on their wives? Even though they have a big presentation to make in a couple of hours? How selfish could you be, honest? I do everything for you, and now I'm getting fed up. He looked me in the eyes and began to say, I thought being married to you would be easy, and things were quite easy, but this was all before this stupid baby came around. Ever since you got pregnant with him, you've been more selfish and lazier. I don't know why you can't understand that being selfish or lazy whilst pregnant is completely normal. What is wrong with you? Do you not understand how physically and emotionally taxing it is to be pregnant? Not only that, but I was far from lazy or selfish as you put it. I was still cooking and cleaning well into my third trimester. And what were you doing? Nothing. You were doing absolutely nothing, while I had to slave away catering to your needs because you don't know how to do anything. I don't know how to do anything? Yeah, okay, let's see. I've been the one working late nights just so that I can get a promotion and extra money to fund your luxurious lifestyle of staying at home all day. Honestly, you have it way easier than me, but for some reason you can't see that. Anna, I think it's time that we part ways. My heart dropped. The baby started crying from all of the yelling that we were doing, and at that moment, Florence came in. Now what in the world is going on? I was gone for five minutes, Anna. Oh, hello, Greg. Hello, Mother. I see you're laying with the enemy. Me? Enemy? You shut your mouth. I should smack you upside the head for the way you've been speaking to Anna. Don't you know that she just gave birth? Yes, everyone's been telling me. Yet for some reason, you cannot seem to grasp the concept of how taxing that process is. You see, Anna, you've even turned my mother against me. So that's it? Do you want us to part ways? Florence gasped and turned to her son. At that moment, you could tell that she was fuming. She started yelling at him, and unfortunately, all of the commotion prompted several nurses to flood into the room to see what was going on. Because Greg was doing most of the yelling, he was the one who was escorted outside. But as he was leaving, he was yelling something along the lines of how he no longer needed me, and that once he gets this promotion, he'll be just fine without me. Once the dust had settled, I could analyze the situation for what it truly was. I broke down. 
all of the years of catering to this man came crashing down on me, and I was truly exhausted. Thankfully, Sam wasn't here to witness everything. At some point during the commotion, he was taken by one of the nurses and put into the nursery. When I was just wailing and sobbing, Florence came by my side to comfort me. She was very soothing, and her motherly touch managed to console some of the aches that were residing in my heart. After what felt like hours of me crying, she finally said, We're going to get back at him. What? We're going to get back at him for all of the trauma he put you through. I am so sorry that I let this get out of control. As a mother, I did my best to raise a kind and respectful man, but I would be lying if I said that I don't see a monster whenever I look at Greg. As a mother, I believe that I've failed. He's too far gone into whatever this is to change now. Even though I failed Greg, I'll be damned if I let you fail Sam. We have to work together to fix this. Florence, I... Listen to me. You have a beautiful baby who doesn't deserve any of the nonsense that Greg tried to give you. He said that it's time to part ways, right? Then maybe that's exactly what you should do. I got scared. Part of the reason why I hadn't left Greg is that without him, I wouldn't be anything. I was working, thank God, but it was not enough to live on my own, let alone with a newborn baby. With that logic, there was a high chance that Sam would be taken away from me and he would have to stay with his awful father. The mere thought of that happening made me sick. I know you're scared, sweetie, but please don't worry. You'll live with me for the time being and we'll figure something out, okay? But right now, that boy needs to be taught a lesson. But, but what are we going to do? Don't worry, I'll handle everything. You just focus on healing and taking care of that sweet little boy. Grandma's got everything covered. She was right when she said that because the events that happen later will completely shock you. About a week after Sam was born was when the revenge was enacted. It turns out that Florence has a lot of lawyer friends as well as friends in the media. This wasn't mentioned before, but Greg works for one of those high-end companies on Wall Street, and as such, it should be noted that any detriment in the company will be broadcasted, at least locally, which is enough to tank a company's reputation. Florence, my savior, managed to get the audio and video recording of what went down in that hospital on 14th of March. To this day, I'm not sure how she convinced the security to let her have that footage, but once she got it, she talked to her friends who work in journalism and media. Within hours on an early Monday morning, Greg was being bombarded with news outlets with headlines such as Hospital CCTV exposes high-powered executive verbally abusing wife after childbirth. Shocking footage reveals husband's disgraceful behavior towards postpartum wife. From CEO to shame, hospital video leaks husband's shocking outburst towards new mother. I can't imagine the look of horror and shame that he must have had on his face. Ever since I was discharged from the hospital, I had been staying with Florence. I think Greg genuinely believed he was in the right, and he was waiting for me to beg him to come home so that we could reunite as a family. But after seeing that I wasn't going to come, he started making threats. I knew he was struggling without me. I mean, who would do the cooking and the cleaning if I wasn't there? And now, with this story that was defaming his character, it was only a matter of time before he got the call from his boss saying that he's been fired and that the company no longer has any affiliations with him. So much for that promotion, right? Like clockwork. He called me after a couple of hours of receiving various death threats from trolls on the internet, as well as being blacklisted from many companies that he was trying to talk to. He explained all of this to me on a phone call. Anna, please stop. I get it. I messed up. I'm so sorry for everything. Life here has been awful without you. I need you and the baby. I don't care if he doesn't have my name. You said his name was Stan, right? I love him and I love you. Please come back home. My life has been ruined, but we can fix it together. I have no interest in coming back to a man who is so selfish that he left his wife moments after she gave birth. I mean, who does that? I'm glad that your entire life is unraveling before your eyes. 
Ever heard of karma? Well, this is her, and turns out that she's a right troll to anyone who deserves it. I hung up the phone, and Greg proceeded to bombard his mother, knowing that she had a part to play in all of this. But she wasn't taking anything from Greg, not his harsh approach and not the sad approach either. Florence, like myself, was completely done with Greg. We both believed that he got everything that was coming to him. Several months had gone by and I was still living with Florence at that time. I had finalized my divorce from Greg. Every time he'd send alimony and child support, he'd try and plead with me for me to rescind my decision. But every time I would adamantly answer no. Greg was living a miserable life and he even had to downgrade the house he was living in as he could no longer afford it. He tried looking for work everywhere, but no one wanted to be associated with the verbally abusive husband and father who cared more about his career than anything. I think he managed to get odd jobs here and there, managing a poor mechanic company and things of that nature. But for the most part, he was struggling. I was actually in the process of writing a book about my struggles with being married to a narcissist. After the local news outlets exposed Greg for his true colors, I went on many interviews and podcasts adding more detail about what happened. I'm so grateful for everyone willing to listen to my story, as they were all so receptive and understanding. I was especially grateful to Florence, of course, as without her input, I would still probably be stuck with Greg. But now, I'm making a name for myself, and my new agent informs me that the prospects of my book doing well are extremely high. I couldn't be happier moving into this next chapter of my life. With lovely and supportive fans, supporters, a big stack of money on the way, and of course, my beautiful family, Florence and Sam, whom I love very dearly. Hello, my name's Harper and I'm 34 years old. I have always been taught and told that as a woman, my place is in the kitchen and the home. Despite this, I would do my best to make a name for myself to avoid being exploited, and that's exactly what I did when my evil husband and mother-in-law conspired to work against me and bring me to my downfall. It all started when I noticed that both my husband and my mother-in-law would make household decisions without my consent and my knowledge. Babe, why am I finding all these plans on expanding the house? When were you going to tell me that this is something you wanted to do? I didn't see any need to tell you since I'm the one making the most money in this house, so I can do what I want. Okay, but I'm your wife. We have to talk about things like this. Get off my back, woman. I don't really know when my sweet Jake turned so sour, but at some point he did, and he's completely unrecognizable at this point. He hates me for some reason, and I just don't know why. I try to be kind to counteract the anger I would constantly receive, but as the years went by, he appeared to be getting worse. Okay, if you want to renovate the house, that's fine. I won't stand in your way. But as your wife, I would like to be a bit more involved in household decisions. Why? I already tell my mom everything, so I don't know why you're so obsessed with wanting to know every single thing. Yeah, and why is that? Why do you always turn to your mother when it comes to decisions that are to do with us? Is she part of this marriage too? I told you to get off my back. Don't make me repeat myself and don't make me do anything I'll regret. This is how our conversations would go nowadays, just constant arguing and fighting. And it was taking a toll on me, my children, my family members and my friends. They all constantly told me to get a divorce and leave him, but I was too loyal. I couldn't bear the thought of no longer being with him. That was until my mother-in-law started to become more involved in our lives and all the dots began to connect. You see, I found out that my mother-in-law and my husband were doing some very unsavory and shady things, and this is how I found out about everything. My mother-in-law would make bi-weekly visits, which were increasing in frequency and length, 
Before, she would only come once a month, and it slowly but steadily grew into more and more visits, which would be fine had she not been such an insane person. Oh, well, if it isn't my favorite daughter-in-law. I'm your only daughter-in-law. Oh, hush now. Can't you let me compliment you in peace? It's no wonder why your husband is always coming to me. You're such a bore. Might I ask what brings you here today? Well, if you must know, I'm here to do some work with my son. Nothing of your concern. If it has anything to do with the household funds that I constantly see depleting, then it is my concern. How dare you accuse me of doing something like that? Stealing? How dare you? Jake will have your head on a platter if I tell him what you just insinuated. I didn't insinuate anything. Perhaps it's your guilty conscience seeping through? Mirabelle stormed off, as mad as can be. I suspected that she was going to complain to her son, but at that point, I didn't care. I had gotten so emotionally detached and distant from this entire situation that I didn't care about the various threats that were constantly hurtled my way. I just did my best to avoid them at all times. That was until I received something suspicious in my email. It read, Hey mom, please remember to get the correct details for Code Harper. We can't let this plan fail. You've put too much effort and care into ensuring that everything works out smoothly for us. I can't wait for everything to go down. We're going to be rich. Love you loads, Jake. I was confused. We're going to be rich? Code Harper? What did all this mean? And why was I part of this plan without actually being informed about anything? After much thought and deliberation, I thought that I should respond to the email. Hey Jake, it appears as though I've been attached to this thread. Please kindly explain to me what is going on. Much love, Harper. After sending the email, Jake decided to call me. I was so shocked by the angry tone in his voice. Hell, ignore what you just saw. It has nothing to do with you. Well, clearly something is going on if you're using my name in your business meetings with your mother. Harper is a common name. Grow up and mind your own business before I do something I regret. What are you going to do, Jake? Huh? Tell me, what are you planning on doing that you're going to regret later? You know, Harper, I don't get angry much, but this time you've done it. I'll see you when I get home. He hung up the phone and I began to get scared. What were these two planning? And why was he being so angry and secretive about everything? Due to his threats, I felt extremely unsafe in the household, so I packed some bags and decided to stay in a hotel for the time being. I couldn't afford to keep spiking my anxiety up because I was constantly in contact with two devils. Once I arrived in the hotel room, I decided to call my friend Ben. Ben and I had been childhood friends and I knew that he would help me during this stressful and troubling time. Ben arrived soon after I called him. Hey, I'm so sorry once again for what happened. Yeah, well, I guess it's just part of the marriage package. Let me show you what the email said. Maybe you can help me out. Okay, sure. I showed Ben the email and he shared the same look of confusion that I had when first reading it. Ben pondered some more and more and finally he said, We need to get inside their heads and figure out what they're doing. I don't know, but something about this seems fishy. We got to find out what they're hiding. And since they don't want to be forthcoming with you, we have to look for other means of acquiring information. Like what? Like checking the account funds and balances. Have you noticed anything recently? Yes. The household funds from the joint bank accounts are steadily decreasing. I ask about it, but you know how Jake and Mirabelle are. Okay, then let's start there. It should be noted that Ben is extremely tech savvy. He's the type of person who can hack into databases if he really wanted to. And his skills were shining during our sleuthing. Once I opened up the bank accounts and bank books for Ben to see, he began his work. 
searching and scouring for any discrepancies, and after several hours of us deliberating and wondering what was going on, we reached a breakthrough. But it was definitely something that we weren't prepared for. It turns out that my lovely husband and mother-in-law were participating in some shady deals to incur more money. This was a hypothesis, but all of our doubts were confirmed when Ben managed to log into my husband's email account and see all of the evidence there for ourselves. Lengthy email chains between Jake and Mirabelle. They were embezzling funds from my husband's company. And that's not all. The gag is that they were going to incriminate me and make it seem like I was the one doing all of this. That's what Code Harper is. It's when they plan to unleash their gruesome attack and make you take the fall for everything. Yes, exactly. Jake would transfer the embezzled funds into the joint bank account and then use that money to make it seem like I was the one doing it. This is honestly a new level of sickness. Why would anyone do something like that? I honestly don't know. I began to break down and sob, but Ben promptly stopped me. No, Harper, this isn't the time to cry. Your life is about to be ruined if we don't do something to stop them. Thank God we now know this information, but now we got to do something about it before it's too late. You're right, but what? What can I do to stop this? Mm, I don't know. Let's think. It would be easy to go to the police with all of this information, but honestly, I needed more to satiate the bubbling rage that was in my core. I had to get back at these clowns and I had to hit them where it hurt. And that's when I got the idea. Okay, I think I got something. Okay, let's hear it. So, we know that these two love money, right? I mean, that's why they're doing all this stuff, right? So get more money. What if I came to Jake with a business proposal that he couldn't refuse? And what if you disguise yourself as the ringleader of this fake shady business so that we can catch them red-handed? That's a brilliant idea. Let's put that to work. After ironing out the details and realizing that time is of the essence, I called Jake to put the plan into action. Where are you? You decided to run away from the consequences? Come back home at once. I didn't run from anything. Actually, I left home because I had to tend to a very important business meeting, a business that you'd be interested in. What kind of business? Oh, it's a special kind, one that you might like. I briefly told him some details of this fake business, doing my best not to disclose everything, but making it sound interesting enough so that his ears would perk up. Ben had informed me of the type of lingo that needed to be used to ensure that Jake suspects that the business is shady, and since we've learned that he's into the shady business, he would most likely accept this business deal. Hmm, sounds interesting. So, you're saying that all I have to do is invest some funds and then the returns would be at a higher rate? Yes, Jake, it's that simple. How much is needed? We have to invest a total of $30,000, but we can do it in installments if you'd like. I'll get back to you. In the background of the call, I heard him talking to Mirabelle about everything, letting her know what I said and debating on whether or not they should do the deal. Mirabelle sounded excited from the little that I heard, and it was confirmed because what Jake said next was shocking. Okay, so we're going to do this, and I'm going to send the full $30,000 so that we can do this quickly. When it comes to these details, time is of the essence. We don't have time to dilly-dally. Okay, which account will you use? I'll send it to the joint bank account, of course. Okay, sure thing. We ended the call. And later on in the evening, Ben and I received an email on Jake's account, and it read, Just sent the $30,000 to the joint bank account. It's like she's putting her nail in her coffin. This is going to be way too easy. She'll go down for our crimes, and we run with the money. Seeing those messages hurt me a lot. After everything, this man wanted to scam me like this. The good thing is, Ben was recording everything, even the phone call that we had with Jake, so that we could build a solid case against them. 
I'm so sorry for everything, Harper. This man doesn't deserve you. I hope you find someone better. Me too. The next morning, Ben returned to my hotel room so that we could continue investigating and building our case against Jake and Mirabel. Not only did I want them to go down for their crimes, I felt like I needed to be compensated for the time that was wasted in our horrendous marriage. I was going to take everything from this man. So I also collated as much evidence and information regarding emotional and mental abuse that I've endured for these years. I was going to make sure that he lives a miserable life alongside his mother. Ben was helping me out so much, and I was so appreciative of everything that he was doing for me. He did make me happy, and sometimes I wondered why I didn't marry him instead. Why are you staring at me like that? No reason. Sorry. No, it's quite all right. Let's get back to work, though. We continued working, and we were finding breakthrough after breakthrough, cementing the plan on how Jake and Mirabel were going to get caught. I wanted the whole ordeal to be public and messy. I wanted to ruin these people's lives the same way they wanted to ruin mine. It was insane to think that such a thing could happen. A week went by and Jake was wondering why I hadn't come home yet. But I was reducing as much contact with him as possible because I knew very soon that he would be behind bars for a very long time. At last... I contacted Jake to initiate the plan that Ben and I had been working on for the past week. And things were falling into place. I invited Mirabel and Jake to a pretty crowded cafe. And once they arrived, the plan was set in motion and I hit record on my voice recorder that was concealed. So glad that you two came. Just cut to the chase. We all shouldn't be out here so publicly. Why did you suggest this busy cafe anyways? I'm getting nervous. Hush, Jake. I quite like this cafe, and besides, it's like we'll hide in plain sight. Fine. It's about time you called us and informed us about the business deal we talked about. What took you so long, and why haven't you been home? Yeah, I've been busy ironing out the details of this deal, honey. Wouldn't you want everything to be precise and meticulous? Trust me. Fine, whatever. But when is our money going to come back to us? Soon, soon, don't worry, but first I would like to know something. Where did you get all that money? What? What are you saying? The $30,000 that you sent into the account, where did you get that? Does it matter where I got it? Aren't you also going to use the money as well? Answer my question, Jake. Why are you interrogating him so much? This is why we don't involve you in our plans, because you have a big fat mouth. You think I don't know the truth? Do you think I don't know just how disgusting and slimy you two are? I know everything. I know that you are embezzling funds from your company. How dare you accuse me of doing such a thing? I would never, and even if I did, you don't have any proof. I decided to make a calculated decision and I said, You're right. I don't have proof, so why don't you just tell me the truth so that we can fix this? Ha! Huh. You see, you don't have proof. Mom, I think we deserve to laugh a little, don't you think? Let me tell her everything. Jake went into full detail about how he started embezzling from his company. He also had no issue exposing that he was going to let me take the fall for it, all the while laughing with his mother looking like two evil villains. After they had a good laugh, I tried to compose myself to not cause a scene. I calmly said, Gotcha. What? I said, Gotcha. I just got you to confessing everything that you were planning on doing. Oh, please, what are you, a detective now? Don't make me laugh. I might not be a detective, but I am smart enough to record things. I then revealed my concealed recorder. I got everything you said here, which was practically a full confession. Honestly, why did you go into so much detail? Mirabel's face turned pale and she shouted, Jake, do something! Jake dived across the table to attempt to snatch it from me, but he was too late. 
He started to cause a scene and the photographers I had hired to capture these moments leapt into action, recording everything. Some young kids also took out their phones and began to stream the event and let me tell you, it was truly something to behold. Jake was being held back by Ben who emerged with the photographers and it was not looking good for the two criminals, honestly. Jake looked like a raging and abusive maniac since he looked like he wanted to kill me and Mirabelle was harassing the onlookers and passers-by, spitting profanities at them and me. It didn't take long for this debacle to go viral and after that I collected as much video evidence, the audio recording I took during the meeting, as well as all of the email chains and bank account details that Ben and I combed through, and I headed to the police station to make my case. It didn't take long for the case to be examined since Ben and I had practically done all the work for them, and not long afterward, Jake, who had promptly been publicly fired and humiliated after making a fool of himself on social media, as well as Mirabelle, who lost her positions as a budding socialite, stood trial for their crimes for embezzling money. The case was broadcasted nationally, and Jake and Mirabel were considered social pariahs at this point. Their faces were plastered on TV screens and newspapers for weeks, and subsequently, Ben and I were accoladed for our efforts and hard work. I think I divorced Jake while his trial was going on, and it was not a good look for him, which made it quite easy for me to get a hefty settlement. With that money, in addition to selling the home that Jake and I had lived in for so long, I couldn't stand being there anymore. I was becoming a financially free and independent woman. I would attend the trials for both Jake and Mirabelle to remind them that I was one step ahead of them and that they weren't as smart as they thought they were. They would often catch my eye in the courtroom and send me nasty glares. There were even moments when the prosecutors would call me to the stand to testify since I was the one who essentially cracked the case. Whenever I would go on the stand, I would tell the prosecutor as many details as I could remember, all the while smiling and antagonizing my awful ex-husband and mother-in-law. If looks could kill, I would be on the floor, but luckily looks don't kill and with the amount of criminal activity that was going on between the two they are going to be in prison for a very very long time so i needn't worry about them getting back at me as i will be living lavishly writing a book about my experiences and how ben and i caught these weasels whilst they would be rotting in prison for the rest of their lives revenge is so sweet